Um, I can't believe I'm standing here in the presence of uh, Sid uh, and our priests talking about my beloved church. So, um, guys, uh, there's going to be some questions as we go, usually around icons. So, first question. Um, where is this icon? Right there. It's not there because it's covered, but it is there. <laughs> Very good. Um, it's one of the most beautiful icons. In fact, our lovely church of St. Mark uh, has got priceless icons that were written by uh, the neo Coptic iconographer Isaac Phillips. And throughout this presentation, we'll have a look. But today, we're coming together to look at the history of our beloved Coptic Orthodox Church. In Isaiah 19, 19, it says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And this is indeed what the Lord has done. Our church is blessed by him. So we're going to look at uh, these items. So we're going to look at the Holy Family in Egypt. Thank you. We're going to look at uh, St. Mark and how he evangelized to Egypt. We're going to look at uh, the Roman emperors. Um, and this helps us to understand the environment that our church flourished in. We're going to look at the age of martyrdom, the school of Alexandria, the three ecumenical councils, monasticism, and then one final slide on modern martyrs. This is just an introduction, but because I couldn't squeeze it all in, I'm going to have to talk really fast. I'm going to have to talk really, really fast. So, um, uh, we start in uh, the Holy Family's journey into Egypt, um, and very, very quickly we know that uh, the Holy Family, under uh, Herod, um, his, his chasing of the infant, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Family uh, fled to Egypt. Um, the first main city that the Holy Family stopped in after arriving in Egypt from Bethlehem was place called Pharma, or ancient Pelusian, on the easternmost mouth of the Nile River. I know this is geographical, but I want to throw you in to the glorious blessings that our country was given, our, our, our lovely Egypt, and where the church blossomed because of it. So outsiders rarely frequent this once thriving old port city in the Sinai Peninsula, but this is the first place where the Holy Family rested. After visiting Pharma, those following the path of the Holy Family would venture into Mostarod, which is north of Cairo, and there are remains of a church and cave being restored at the moment, and it's reputed to have been where the Holy Family stayed during their time there. Uh, in a small town near Mostarod, there is also a spring, which supposedly sprang from the earth upon the arrival of the Holy Family where our Lord Jesus Christ realized that his family were thirsty and he commanded the water to spring forth. Uh, the third main stop was in Saha, otherwise known as Pecha Isos. Pecha Isos, the foot of our Lord Jesus. And the, I, the picture we have on the left is a, a stone that you can go into the church and see a footprint of the uh, young child, young infant, our Lord Jesus Christ. So. Well, they're not true. Can you imagine that our Lord Jesus Christ, his family, journeyed through Wedding the Trun, and then later it's going to be a rich place that will never stop uh, having praise and worship night and day of the hermits and the church fathers till now. So wherever our Lord visited, he left behind history. He left behind living, living history that never stopped. So uh, where the Natrun, as we know, now hosts four monasteries, four ancient monasteries. Um, so uh, the fifth main stopping point is closer to Cairo in the neighborhood districts of Ain Ain Shams and Matari. And the famed sycamore tree that's there now, known as the Virgin Mary's tree, is located near there and is also said to have provided shade for the Holy Family. There is also a balsam tree that proposedly uh, sprouted from the spot when St. Mary threw out some water. I think this is the same balsam tree that they use in making the holy oil. Um, is that right for, for the Christmas? That's till now. 
That same tree is used for making the holy oil until now. Next on the list is Old Cairo, formerly known as Babylon, where the Holy Family took refuge in a cave after inciting the wrath of the governor of Babylon. I wonder why. Can you imagine the Holy Family coming in and idols falling left, right and centre? Their effect, the effect of our Lord Jesus Christ, couldn't have been helped. And so they, um, they, they ventured uh, into a, a cave there, and that cave is now the church of Abu Soga. And it was built on top of the site where um, some time later, on the Holy Family then ventured to Miami, which was another major point along their path. They boarded a sailboat that took them downriver to southern Egypt, or upriver, because you're in upriver, sorry, to southern Egypt. And the Virgin Mary Church now occupies the docking point in Miami, where they got onto a boat, where they set and departed. The very same steps that the Holy Family used to reach the water are still present till now on the grounds. A notable event happened in 1976 where a, a whole ancient Bible was found floating up the Nile, found in that same spot. And it was open to Isaiah mm -hmm. chapter 19, there will be an altar in the midst of Egypt, the whole Egypt, my people. The sailboat carrying the Holy Family from Miami arrived at the village of Deir el-Gamnus. However, they again only stayed a short time before heading to Gabal Deir. There the Holy Family sought refuge from the elements in a shaded cave, which is now the Virgin Mary Monastery uh, that exists. They also passed the laurel tree near Gabal Deir, and it's claimed there that the tree bowed down. Have a look at this picture. The tree bowed down top right. You might not see it. It's not very big. I've got it big here. But look it up. The tree that has bowed down to give shade to the Holy Family. It's unique and its branches and climb downwards. It's commonly referred to as Abed or the worshipper. Sorry for my Arabic pronunciation. The Holy Family continued heading south, reportedly not staying long for long in any village or town, except at one place where they rested for a full six months, Gebel el Kuskon, el Kuskan, where there is a Muharraq monastery until now. And later, our Lord appeared much later after um, the resurrection. He came and he blessed that monastery himself. As I was hearing from one of the messages yesterday. Basu is Mount Dronka, which is where the Holy Family stopped to restore their strength. And there is another cave, which has another monastery built. What rich history our church has, it's unbelievable. But why this history, what effect did it have on us? So, a few years later, St. Mark the Evangelist, who we're proud, is our apostle, the apostle to Egypt. St. Mark, one of the 70 apostles, mentioned in Mark chapter 10, verse 10, one of the four evangelists, he's regarded, uh, uh, he is our apostle to Egypt. St. Mark was African in nature, um, grew up in the Pentapolis in Libya, and, and then his whole family journeyed to Jerusalem. He was educated in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. His family was highly religious, and he was the cousin of St. Barnabas. So then it rings a bell that in the book of Acts, St. Barnabas takes him with him, even when Peter said, uh, I can't trust him as much. At first, St. Mark accompanied St. Peter in his missionary journeys inside Jerusalem and Judea. Then he accompanied St. Paul and St. Barnabas on their first missionary journey to Antioch. And on the skip to, he then journeys later, in between, just before the martyrdom of St. Peter and St. Paul. Just before that, he goes to Pentapolis where he grew up, preaches Christ to his native people, and many convert, and he appoints uh, a bishop and some, uh, some priests. Then he journeys by way of the, the desert to Alexandria. So he didn't come from the sea route by way of the desert into Alexandria. And because that journey was long, his sandals became worn and he went to, uh, as we know, uh, a cobbler, uh, St. Ananias, who became our second patriarch after. his hand piercing it quite horribly and he cried out oh the living god so mark said let me tell you about the living god this is now 
the beginning of evangelism in Egypt started. Sorry. Thank you. Keep doing that, please. <laughs> so, um, he then left Egypt, went to Rome, witnessed and served St. Peter and St. Paul before their martyrdom in 64 AD under the hand of Nero Caesar. And then he journeyed back to Egypt, um, uh, first Libya and, um, and, and then Egypt. Or, and, and then in Egypt, there was such a stir because Christianity had spread and it was causing uh, a, a huge disturbance in Alexandria. And at the feast of uh, the um, the gods, uh, the Egyptian god Serapis, I think, um, it happened to con coincide that year with the Easter celebration. The people came out of the temple of this Egyptian god and decided to attack the church and out they dragged St. Mark, tied him to a horse and started dragging him through the cobbled streets of Alexandria where his blood began to spill. That night though, he went he was taken back into prison and he was healed and he was told by an angel of the Lord that this will be your martyrdom. The next day they came, the, the, the throng, idol worshippers took him and he was again dragged through the streets of Alexandria and he shed his precious blood on the very streets in Alexandria. So then moving on very quickly to the Roman emperors. Why is this relevant? Our church didn't grow up. because of the toil and struggle that we underwent. And in the early church, just having a look at the, the, the emperors and the effect that the emperors had, the early church fathers counted 10 seasons of repeated attacks by emperors. And so these 10 that I've listed, they're not all the emperors, but they're the 10 emperors that created persecution for the Christian people at the time. It began with Nero Caesar, who thought himself a, a poet and uh, a, a philosopher. He burned Rome himself, um, though he didn't let his people know, because he felt that the streets were too narrow. Who is he going to blame? I'll blame the Christians. And so began the first persecution of Christians, not just in Rome. Remember, Rome had controlled Egypt and spread out throughout the, the civilized world. And so that persecution spread. And there was a, a view that if you could not confess and worship the idols, there's an edict that was sent all the way around, then you would be killed. And so the persecution of Christians started. Domitian, who exiled St. John the Beloved in Patmos, continued that uh, horrible uh, persecution of, um, of Christians. Um, along with Domitian, we have uh, amazing saints such as uh, Clements and uh, others, St. Irenaeus and others, who were martyred in that time. Um, Trajan was the emperor who then, after that, began to kill Christians. Notable among them is two amazing stories. I put the icon of St. Ignatius. He was in his late 90s. He was uh, um, a very old bishop. And they brought him into, there's a, a bigger story, but eventually they brought him into the Colosseum. And he was told in front of the emperor, all these 80 years till now, let the lions grind my bones to dust. And so he received the crown of martyrdom with those words. Amazing. So, uh, and then we have the uh, philosopher, Emperor, so called Marcus Aurelius, who <laughs> thought himself a great philosopher, um, left behind um, quite a, a group of books on philosophy. But one thing annoyed him is that how can I control Rome if Christians do not hold the idea that uh, the, the emperor is, is divine? And so he continued that huge persecution of, of Christians. Um, Septimus Severus was several emperors after him. Um, he was originally uh, from Syria and he began to. He came to England as well. Septimus, Septimus Severus. Died in Europe. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Actually, Rafael, have you read some of Marcus Aurelius's yeah, the philosophy way. as well? But we'll get to that another well, time. Marcus Aurelius couldn't control his own wife, which led to Egypt as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So he couldn't control Christians either. <laughs> so, uh, during the time of Septimus Severus, um, he began and continued to attack Christians, but it wasn't until Caius Thrax that things got even worse. Before, if you were found out to be a Christian, you were presented and asked to present incense in front of the idols. Now, after Caius Thrax and especially Emperor Decius, you were sought. Huge amount of people were, were, uh, sought, were sent to uh, underground churches. To, to bring out bishops, and to bring out priests, and to bring out the laity, and to drag them along the streets of any country in which Christian resided, and they would be killed, almost. What he was trying to do was not just the extermination of the Christians, but the complete extinction of Christianity itself. Remember, this is the environment that our church flourished in. Christianity didn't reduce in Rome, didn't reduce in Egypt, but flourished under this persecution. Amazing. It must have been such a, a powerful time for people to realize that they could die at any moment and the, the word of God must have been richly present among them. Valerian came next and um, one of the notable uh, martyrdom that we'll talk about uh, okay we'll, we'll move on uh, then Diocletian so Diocletian is such a severe time of martyrdom that we began our church calendar by the first year that we began to reign in 284 as emperor uh, he placed himself as emperor of uh, Egypt and a few other areas while he appointed three other emperors to govern other parts of Rome. In this time, it was marked by successive stages in severity, ever increasing uh, killing of bishops, priests, deacons, laity. At one point, as we know many points, actually they would go into towns and villages and the town and village would say we're Christians. And it was said that the whole village would or town would be killed and slaughtered and that the blood of the martyrs would come up to the knees of the horses. This is the beloved history. Whenever we do end up journeying to Egypt, let's realize that our forefathers, mothers, blood was in. Um, the school of Alexandria, actually, we have martyred them next. So in that age of martyrdom, I just want to point out uh, some amazing, um, some amazing saints. So St. Macarius, obviously, then where is his icon in our church? At the back? Absolutely, it's still not covered, but it's got glass covering, so hopefully it'll be safe. It's renovation. So he was born in Rome, enlisted the army of Emperor Decius, so that's why the emperors are important and we did that. And, and he won amazing battles in the very sight of Emperor Decius. Emperor Decius then, when they journeyed back to Rome, he wanted to honour the, the battles that were won. And he also wanted to honour his, his general, Philopatir uh, Morocorius. And so he asked him to join him to offer incense to uh, the, the, the idols of Rome. And Philopatir refused. The emperor was incensed, but you're my general. How could you do this? And he said, no, I serve the Christ and I'm a Christian. And so his anger grew. He bound him in iron fetters. Um, there's a story told that, uh, that is true, um, that all the generals under him, uh, when they saw him brutally being beaten, that they all confessed their Christianity. They were martyred. Then he was uh, beheaded. His body was revealed later to a poor man after the persecution of Decius ended. Later on, after he'd been martyred by a while, St. Basil the Great is under house arrest by Emperor Julian, Julian the Apostate. 
and he looks at the icon of uh, St. Uh, Philippa de Recaris that he must have carried with him, and he asks the intercession, St. Philippa. faithfully denounced this Christianity, comes back and there is blood shown on his sword in the icon and St. Basil the Great knows that uh, his prayers have been answered. St. Abano, where is the icon of St. Abano? In our church, absolutely. Um, and you'll notice that in our church it's next to the icon of Archangel Michael. Why? Archangel Michael helped St. Abano, who's a 12 year old witness to Christ, heal him many days um, and would appear to him to heal him. So St. Abanu was born in the, um, the Hisa in Egypt. His parents died when he was young, leaving him their possessions and their fortune. But one day he heard uh, a priest requesting that all should remain faithful during the persecution of Emperor Diocletian. Not only did he remain faithful, he said, I want to be a martyr. So he journeyed and came uh, uh, home first, distributed his wealth to the poor, and then he journeyed uh, to Samanu to confess his faith. And on the way, Archangel Michael first appeared to him to prepare him for the suffering he was about to have. And the governor placed him upside down in a boat that journeyed uh, to uh, the place where he was in, to Alexandria. But while on that journey, something happened. As they began beating him and making fun of him, his nose began to, to bleed amongst the other parts of his body. And then the soldiers were frozen. They couldn't beat him anymore. Something happened. And it wasn't until the young 12-year-old saint prayed for them that they began to move again. They confessed their Christianity. They arrived in uh, Atrevis where they confessed their Christianity. All the soldiers were killed. And then uh, St. Abanum was sent to Alexandria where he was tortured and eventually he earned the crown of martyrdom there in Alexandria. St. Demiana, where is the icon of St. Demiana in our church? In the ladies' altar. So St. Demiana was born in Egypt. In her house with her 40 uh, friends who wanted to live the virginal life as well. They built, he built a house for them on the outskirts of the city. Um, and uh, uh, he came home and so... In the time of the Emperor Diocletian, this famous father of St. Damiana uh, was called to Diocletian and he faltered in the faith. He worshipped the idols and St. Damiana heard about it and she went to visit him and she said to him, if I had heard that you had died, I would have been happier than to hear that you had denounced our Saviour. And there and then he announced his Christianity again. He was tortured, he was killed, he was martyred. And then um, Diocletian realized that it was his daughter that had told him and that had. So he decided, okay, I'm going to torture you and you will denounce your Christ. And in front of her, the 40 virgins were killed. And lastly, she received the crown of martyrdom. Again, this is the rich history that is around all of our church icons and is, uh, that we inherit the history of martyrs. Uh, of which we celebrate today and next week. Um, the School of Alexandria, we can't have an intro to the Coptic Church without talking about the effect that not only did we give riches of the martyr's blood to our church, but we also gave a lot of learning. So founded by St. Mark, and it's the oldest centre for sacred sciences and Christianity. Um, uh, it was also the, center, the time... Um, the, the, where allegorical understanding of the Bible was started off. Allegorical means that every word in the Bible has a spiritual meaning, and they were going to find that spiritual meaning. Find and interpret those numbers. So the allegorical uh, interpretation of the Bible is gifted to the world by uh, the school of Alexandria. It was started as a school originally to teach Christianity to the, those who wanted to be baptized, but changed very, very quickly into an educational center. So its program first uh, was a systematic theological study, and it used philosophy as a tool for defending the faith, taught not only Christian theology, but philosophy and science. Three main courses were available, largely created by 
Clement, um, one of the, the, the heads of the School of Alexandria, and those were a course to non-Christians on the principles of Christianity, a second course on Christian morals, a third on advanced course on divine wisdom. And all of that, like we will hear today with uh, the lovely choir of Uncle Michelle, they didn't just teach, they worshipped side by side with the liturgy, with the Thesbecha. So if you were a student at that college, you had to be part of the life and worship of that college. Its deans, the famous deans were Athenagoras, uh, and he was the, the, one of the, the early deans. He was anxious to write against Christianity, but the more he studied and read the Holy Scripture in order to, to attack Christianity, he became so attracted to Christianity that the Holy Spirit seized him and he became a defender of the faith, even writing to Emperor, um, to one of the emperors, uh, Marcus Aurelius, and to defend, uh, using philosophy, the Christian faith. Pantheonus was uh, uh, another famous head of the, you know, of the school of Alexander after Athenagoras. He was a well-known uh, uh, teacher of Christianity and a disciple of Athenagoras, and he gained fame for his ability to educate In 190 AD, Pope Demetrius, the 12th Pope of Alexandria, the vine dresser, elected him for the Christian mission to preach in India. In his journey, he brought the Gospel of St. Matthew, written by his own hand in Hebrew. So again, right from the beginning, our church is a church of mission. St. Clement of Alexandria, he was the father of the Christian philosophy in Alexandria, and this course that I talked about was in three parts. And he was well versed in scripture, born around the year AD 150, and uh, he travelled all over Italy, Syria, Palestine, preaching Christ. At the end of his journeys, uh, he reached Alexandria, and there he settled and, and grew the college to an amazing point. Among his pupils were Oregon, the great teacher that we'll hear about now. Um, that Clement of Alexandria wrote amazing three books, one of them called The Exhortation to the Greeks, another The Stromata, but Oregon, one of the most famous teachers of the School of Alexandria, um, who I put um, rather cheaply, certainly, I put a picture, an icon from the Greek Orthodox Church, because in our church he's not a saint, because he was excommunicated, and he should not have an icon in the Greek Orthodox Church either, but there is one. <laughs> But um, Origanus wrote over 5,000 books. He was such a brilliant mind that many attributed genius to him. Um, we won't go into that, we don't have much time, but uh, maybe in other discussions we'll look at it. Uh, ecumenical councils. So not only did we give the Christian world teaching through our, uh, our school that brought rich richness in interpretation of the Bible, in philosophy, in being able to defend Christianity through its teachings. We also ended up having a huge prominence in the three early church councils, the only three that we recognize. To defend the faith. So in um, 325 AD, it should say not 318 in my comment, um, Pope Alexandrus went to the Council of Nicaea in Nicaea and he took with him 20 bishops and one 25 year old young deacon, uh, Deacon uh, Athanasius. And there the Arian heresy was denounced. So Arius uh, believes that the Son is not equal to the Father and is created and that the Holy Spirit is also created. Who defends? A young deacon in the presence of such holy men at the Council of Nicaea, a young 25-year-old hero of the faith, gets up and defends and says, no, Christ is fully uh, of one substance with the Father. The same substance is a better translation. Uh, he is of the same substance as the Father and the Holy Spirit. Other things that were discussed in that council, and Arius was deposed as a heretic, were the date of Easter, whether uh, um, those that denounced the faith because of uh, such huge persecution and then came back to the church, should they be rebaptized? It was agreed, again, because of uh, a great saint in our church called St. Dogmontius. Imagine a saint walking the, the, the corridors 
of the school uh, where, where they, of the church where they had this council. But he was a confessor, and not just had lost an eye, it's an aged man, and everyone recognized the, the beauty and saintliness of Bernotus. And then when it came to the discussion, should we um, have our priests be married or celibate? The Roman Catholic Church said we should have our priests be celibate. And then Pugmontius got up and he said, we should not add the burden of celibacy to our priests. They serve in the world. They serve in the world. The whole council agreed that, okay, if the Church of Rome wants to have their priests be celibate, fine, but the rest of the churches will be able to marry their priests, but not just of Egypt. It's amazing of our church. So Constantinople, another council that was held in 381 AD, 150 fathers, church fathers were assembled. Uh, pope Timothy, the 22nd Pope of Alexandria, uh, comes to that, uh, um, that uh, council. And also St. Cyril of Jerusalem is there, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil the Great, and what are they defending? They are defending the heresy against the heresy of Macedonius, uh, uh, Apollinarian, and Sibelius, who were trying to say that the Holy Spirit is not equal to the Father and the Son, and that the Holy Spirit is created. I thought we discussed that in Nicaea. No, so we had to discuss it again. And they referred to the, the text of the Council of Nicaea as well, but they defended it so much that added to the creed is we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life that proceeds from the Father. Uh, chairing that comfort, that council, is Pope Timothy, the 22nd Pope of Alexandria. The third ecumenical council of Ephesus in 431 AD was chaired by St. Cyril, the Great of Alexandria. He is the 24th Pope and he brought with him 50 bishops and St. Shinoda the Archimandrite. Where is the icon of St. Shinoda the Archimandrite? It's actually behind that one, I think. David, I'm not sure. It's behind the, the actual screen, or it might be on the right. But we've got definitely St. Um, uh, um, the Koinonia, Pachom, Pachom, you see, Pachom is next to St. Athanasius here on the right. So, uh, the heresy was the heresy of the story that St. Mary gave birth only Uh, can only be called the mother of Jesus only and not the mother of God. And the church, through the amazing St. Cyril the Great, defended that our Lord Jesus Christ and his mother, the mother of God, he became uh, united with his humanity and divinity in the womb of the Virgin St. Mary, so she should be called the mother of God. Let me go on to the next slide. Uh, guys, there's only seven slides. This is the last one. Not only did we give the church the blood of the martyrs, not only did we give the church such tremendous teaching through the, church, the school of Alexandria, not only did we defend the faith of the, of the fundamental beliefs of Christianity, uh, for all of Christianity till now, but we also gave the church monasticism. So St. Paul was the first hermit. Uh, he was a rich young orphan at the age of 16. He fled the persecution of Theseus. Now you see how the, the persecution of the emperors had an effect in Egypt. And he fled to the desert where he was fed by a half loaf of bread from the age of 16 till he died at the age of 113 years old. Before he died, he met St. Anthony. And uh, on that day, um, the Lord sent a crow with a full loaf of bread um, because the Lord knew that they were having such an amazing meeting, they needed their food together, and they praised God together. St. Anthony was born 251 AD, and at 18 years old, heard the gospel, if you want to be perfect, you shall give to the poor and come follow me. His parents had already died, he was given uh, protection of his sister, he put her in a convent, in a uh, virginal house. Now, what's notable here, is that Alexandria also gave us the first monastic communities in virginal houses for the whole world. So St. Syncletica is the first monastic community in the world for women. She founded it in Alexandria, and her story biography is told in writing by Pope Athanasius, the 20th 
Patriarch of Alexandria, and St. Pachomius then established two women's convents, and St. Shinuti, the Archimandrite, established a monastery opposite the White Monastery for ladies, and he had over 1,800 nuns and 2,000, 20,000 monks. Uh, let me just make sure I've got it. 22,000 monks and 1,800 nuns. Amazing numbers. Um, time is running out. It doesn't even end there. There are even ancient documents pertaining to monasticism being spread by Egyptians to, to Europe. Ireland. Yeah, to Ireland yeah. in the 7th century. And that's why in Ireland, the Amon is, is a common name because it, it comes from the, the Armenian, which is the And Egyptian. if you visit the ancient Church of Ireland, their cross is a, a cross like the, the ancient Egyptian cross of life. If you go to Switzerland, um, um, you'll notice churches that are named after St. Maurice. Uh, Maurice was killed by Emperor Dabakan. He was the, the, the Theban Legion. So he took the, he was the general of the Theban Legion from Thebes all the way to Switzerland. He quelled a, a, an uprising, a rebel uprising. And when Dabakan asked him to, to murder them, they converted the population to Christianity. Amazing. And they, 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 I, and they were all more clear. I will stop here. With, sorry, Robert, with my last slide. Um, that, um, come on. So, our church has not stopped shedding its blood for Christianity till now. And um, our lovely bishop, Robert Angelus, uh, set up a day when we commemorate throughout the whole world, and especially um, in the UK, the uh, martyrdom of the 21 martyrs of Libya. I will stop my introduction because there's so much more to follow. But thank you, and I'm so honoured to talk about my church.